Chapter 52 The focus of Bishop O'Regan's tyrannical wrath fell primarily upon the French-Canadian congregations of Chicago and St. Anne. His diabolical plan was nothing less than their complete destruction. Shortly after Easter, 1856, the bishop put his plan into action. The Reverend Monsieur Le Maire was interdicted and anonymously driven from the Chicago diocese without cause, leaving the French Canadians without a pastor. A few days later, the parsonage was sold for $1,200 to an American. The beautiful little church which stood on the lot next to the parsonage was removed five or six blocks southwest and rented by the bishop to the parish Catholics for about $2,000 per annum. Not one word was given my countrymen, who incidentally had built those fine buildings with their own money. On August 19, 1856, the bishop, having heard that I was in Chicago, sent for me. Though not absolutely drunk, I found him full of wine and terribly excited. Mr. Chinnaquee, he said, you had promised to make use of your influence to put an end to the rebellious conduct of your countrymen against me. But I found that they are even more insolent and unmanageable than ever. And my firm belief is that you are at fault. You and the handful of French Canadians of Chicago give me more trouble than all the rest of my priests and my people of Illinois. You are too near Chicago, sir. Your influence is too much felt on your people here. I must remove you to a distant place where you will have enough to do without meddling in my administration. I want your service in Cahokia in my diocese of Quincy and if you are not there by the 15th of September next, I will interdict and excommunicate you and forever put an end to your intrigues. My lord, you speak of interdict and excommunication. Allow me respectfully to tell you that if you can show me that I have done anything to deserve to be interdicted or excommunicated, I will submit in silence to your sentence. But before you pass that sentence, I ask you in the name of God to make a public inquest about me and have my accusers confront me. I warn your lordship that if you interdict or excommunicate me without holding an inquest, I will make use of all the means which our holy church puts in the hands of her priest to defend my honor and prove my innocence. I will also appeal to the laws of our great republic, which protects the character of all her citizens against anyone who slanders them. It will then be at your risk and peril that you will pass such a sentence against me. My calm answer greatly excited his rage. He violently struck the table with his fist and said, I do not care a straw about your threats. I repeat it, Mr. Chinnaquee, if you are not at Cahokia, by the 15th of next month, I will interdict and excommunicate you. Feeling that it was a folly on my part to argue with a man who was beside himself with passion and excess of wine, I immediately left the room to take the train to St. Anne. Having spent a part of that night praying to God to change the heart of my bishop and keep me in the midst of my people, I address the following letter to the bishop. To the Right Reverend O'Regan, Bishop of Chicago. My lord, the more I consider your design to turn me out of the colony which I founded and of which I am the pastor, the more I believe it a duty which I owe to myself, my friends, and to my countrymen to protest before God and man against what you intend to do. Not a single one of your priests stands higher than I do in the public mind. Neither is more loved and respected by his people than I am. I defy my bitterest enemies to prove the contrary, and that character, which is my most precious treasure, you intend to despoil me of by ignominiously sending me away from among my people. Certainly I have enemies, and I am proud of it. The chief ones are well known in this country as the most depraved of men. The cordial reception, they say, they have received from you has not taken away the stains they have on their foreheads. By this letter, I again request you to make a public and most minute inquest into my conduct. My conscience tells me that nothing can be found against me. Such a public and fair dealing with me would confound my accusers. But I speak of accusers, when I do not really know if I have any. Where are they? What are their names? Of what sin do they accuse me? All these questions, which I put to you last Tuesday, were left unanswered. And would to God that you would answer them today by giving me their names. I am ready to meet them before any tribunal. Before you strike the last blow on the victim of this most hellish plot, I request you in the name of God to give a moment's attention to the following consequences of my removal from this place at present. You know I have a suit with Mr. Spink at the Urbana Court for the beginning of October. My lawyers and witnesses are all in Kankakee and Iroquois County. And in the very time I want most to be here to prove my innocence and guard my honor, you order me to go to a place more than 300 miles distant. 
Did you ever realize that by that strange conduct you help Mr. Speak against your own priest? When at Cahokia, I will have to bear the heavy expenses of traveling more than 300 miles many times to consult my friends or be deprived of their valuable help. Is it possible that you thus try to tie my hands and feet and deliver me into the hands of my remorseless enemies? Since the beginning of that suit, Mr. Spink proclaims that you help him and that with the perjured priests, you have promised to do all in your power to crush me down. For the sake of the sacred character you bear, do not show so publicly that Mr. Spink's boastings are true. For the sake of your high position in the church, do not so publicly lend a helping hand to the heartless land speculator of Le Rabble. He has already betrayed his Protestant friends to get a wife. He will, ere long, betray you for less. Let me then live in peace here till that suit is over. By turning me away from the settlement, you destroy it. More than nine-tenths of the immigrants come here to live near me. By striking me, you strike them all. Where will you find a priest who will love that people so much as to give them every year from one to two thousand dollars as I have invariably done? It is the price of those sacrifices that, with the poorest class of immigrants from Canada, I have found here, in four years, a settlement which cannot be surpassed, or even equaled, in the United States for its progress. And now that I have spent my last cent to form this colony, you turn me out of it. Our college, where 150 boys are receiving such a good education, will be closed the very day I leave, for you know very well the teachers I got from Montreal will leave as soon as I do. Ah, if you are merciless towards the priests of St. Anne, have pity on these poor children. I would rather be condemned to death than to see them destroy their intelligence by running in the streets. Let me then finish my work here and give me time to strengthen these young institutions which would fall to the ground with me. If you turn me out or interdict me as you say you will do if I disobey your order, my enemies will proclaim that you treat me with the rigor because you have found me guilty of some great iniquity, and this necessarily will prejudice my judges against me. They will consider me as a vile criminal. For who will suppose in this free country that there is a class of men who can judge a man and condemn him as our Bishop of Chicago is doing today without giving him the names of his accusers or telling him of what crimes he is accused? In the name of God, I again ask you not to force me to leave my colony before I prove my innocence and the iniquity of Spink to the honest people of Urbana. But if you are deaf to my prayers, and if nothing can deter you from your resolutions, I do not wish to be in the most unenviable position of an interdicted priest among my countrymen. Send me by return mail my letters of mission for the new places you intend trusting to my care. The sooner I get there, the better for me and my people. I am ready. When on the road of exile, I will pray the God of Abraham to give me the fortitude and the faith he gave Isaac. When laying his head on the altar, he willingly presented his throat to the sword. I will pray my Savior, burying his heavy cross to the top of Calvary, to direct and help my steps towards the land of exile. You have prepared for your devoted priest, C. Chenequi. The following day, we heard that the drunkard priests around us were publishing that the bishop had interdicted me, and they had received orders from him to take charge of the colony of St. Anne. I immediately called a meeting of the whole people, and told them, The bishop has not interdicted me. As the neighboring priests publish, he has only threatened to do so, if I do not leave this place for Cahokia by the 15th of next month. But though he has not interdicted me, it may be that he does falsely publish that he has done it. We can expect anything from the destroyer of this fine congregation of the French Canadians of Chicago. He wants to destroy me and you as he has destroyed them. But before he immolates us, I hope that with the help of God, we will fight as Christian soldiers for our life, and we will use all the means which the laws of our church, the holy word of God, and the glorious constitution of the United States allow us to employ against our merciless tyrant. I ask you as a favor to send a deputation of four members of our colony, in whom you place the most implicit confidence, to carry this letter to the bishop. But before delivering it, they will put to him the following questions, the answers of which they will write down with great care in his presence, and deliver them to us faithfully. It is evident that we are now entering into a momentous struggle. We must act with prudence and firmness. Messrs. J. B. Lemoyne, Leon Melo, Francis Betchard, and B. Allaire, having been unanimously chosen for that important mission, we gave them the following questions to put to the bishop. First, have you interdicted Mr. Chenequi? Second, why have you interdicted him? 
Is Mr. Chinnickwee guilty of any crime to deserve to be interdicted? Have those crimes been proven against him in a canonical way? 3. Why do you take Mr. Chinnickwee away from us? Our deputies came back from Chicago with the following answers, which they swore to sometime later before a Kankakee court. First, I have suspended Mr. Chinnickwee on the 19th on account of his stubbornness and want of submission to my orders when I ordered him to Cahokia. Second, if Mr. Chinnickwee has said mass since, as you say, he is a regular, and the Pope alone can restore him in his ecclesiastical and sacerdotal functions. 3. I take him away from St. Anne despite his prayers and yours, because he has not been willing to live in peace and friendship with the Reverend Messrs. Labelle and Carthival, the bishop being asked if those two priests had not been interdicted by him for public scandals, was forced to say yes. 4. My second reason for taking Mr. Chenequi from St. Anne and sending him to his new mission is to stop the lawsuit Mr. Spink has instituted against him. The bishop being asked if he would promise that the suit would be stopped by the removal of Mr. Chenequi answered, I cannot promise that. Fifth, Mr. Chenequi is one of the best priests in my diocese and I do not want to deprive him of his services. No accusation against his morality has been proved before me. Sixth, Mr. Chinnickwee has demanded an inquest to prove his innocence against certain accusations made against him. He asked me the names of his accuser to confound them. I have refused to grant his request. After the bishop made those declarations, the deputation presented him with the letter of Mr. Chinnickwee. It evidently made a deep impression upon him. As soon as he read it, he said, Seventh, tell Mr. Chinnickwee to come and meet me to prepare for his new mission, and I will give him the letters he wants to go and labor there. Francis Betchard, J.B. Lemoyne, Basilic Allaire, Leon Melo. These gentlemen, with the exception of Mr. Allaire, are still living, as of 1885. After the above had been read and delivered to the people, I showed them the evident falsehood and contradictions of the bishop's responses. Now, my friends, here is the law of our holy church. If a man had been unjustly condemned, let him pay no attention to the unjust sentence. Let him even do nothing to have that unjust sentence removed, Canon of the Church, by Pope Galatians. It strikes me today, for the first time, that it is more your destruction as a people than mine which the bishop wants to accomplish. It is my desire to remain in your midst to defend your rights as Catholics. If you are true to me, as I will be to you in the impending struggle, we have nothing to fear, for our holy Catholic Church is for us. All her laws and canons are in our favor. The Gospel of Christ is for us. The God of the Gospel is for us. Even the Pope to whom we will appeal will be for us. The Archbishop of St. Louis, to whom I brought my complaint in April last, advised me to write the Pope and tell him of the criminal deeds of Bishop O'Regan. If you are true to yourselves as Catholics and Americans, you will not allow that mitred tyrant to accomplish here the same atrocities he has committed against our fellow countrymen in Chicago. If you promise to stand by your rights, I will tell that avaricious bishop, come and sell our parsonage and our church here if you dare. We have a glorious battle to fight. It is the battle of freedom against the most cruel tyranny the world has ever seen. It is the battle of truth against falsehood. It is the battle of the old gospel of Christ against the new gospel of Bishop O'Regan. Let us be true to ourselves to the end and of our holy church. And our holy church, which that bishop dishonors, will bless us. Our Savior Jesus Christ, whose gospel is dismissed by that adventurer, will be for us and give us a glorious victory. Have you not read your Bibles that Jesus wanted his disciples to be free when he said, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. John 8.36 Does that mean that the Son of God wants us to be slaves of Bishop O'Regan? No, cried out the whole people. May God bless you for your understanding of your Christian rights. Let all those who want to be free with me raise their hands. Thanks be to God, I exclaimed again. There is not a traitor among us. You are all the true, brave, and noble soldiers of liberty, truth, and righteousness. May the Lord bless you all. It is impossible to describe the enthusiasm of the people. Before dismissing them, I said, We will, no doubt, very soon witness one of the most ludicrous comedies ever played on this continent. The comedy is generally called excommunication. Some drunkard priest sent by the drunkard bishop of Chicago will soon come to excommunicate us. I expect their visits in a few days. That performance will be worth seeing, and I hope that you will see and hear the most amusing thing in your life. I was not mistaken. 
The very next day we heard that the 3rd of September had been chosen by the bishop to excommunicate us. I said to the people, When you see the flag of the free and the brave floating from the top of our steeple, come and rally around that emblem of liberty. There were more than 3,000 people on our beautiful hill when the priests made their appearance. A few minutes before, I had said to that immense gathering, I bless God that you are so many to witness the last tyrannical act of Bishop O'Regan. But I have a favor to ask of you. It is that no insult whatever will be made to the priests who come to play that comedy. Please do not say an angry word. Do not move a finger against the performers. They are not responsible for what they will do, for two reasons. One, they will probably be drunk. Two, they are bound to do whatever work by their master, the Lord Bishop O'Regan. The priests arrived at about 2 o'clock p.m., and never such a shouting and clapping of hands had been heard in our colony as on their appearance. Never had I seen my people so cheerful and good-humored as when one of the priests, trembling from head to foot with terror and drunkenness, tried to read the following sham act of excommunication, which he nailed to the door of the chapel. The Reverend Monsieur Chiniqui, heretofore curate of St. Anne, colony of Beaver, in the Diocese of Chicago, has formally been interdicted by me for canonical purposes. The said Mr. Chiniqui, notwithstanding that interdict, has maliciously performed the functions of the holy ministry in administering the holy sacraments and saying Mass. This has caused him to be irregular and in direct opposition to the authority of the Church. Consequently, he is a schismatic. Then said Mr. Chiniqui, thus named by my letters and verbal injunction, has absolutely persisted in violating the laws of the Church and disobeying her authority and is, by this present letter, excommunicated. I forbid any Catholic having any communication with him in spiritual matters under pain of excommunication. Every Catholic who goes against the suspense is excommunicated. Signed, Anthony, Bishop of Chicago and Administrator of Quincy, September 3, 1856. As soon as the priests who had nailed this document to the door of our chapel had gone away at full speed, I went to see it and found what I had expected that it was not signed by the bishop, neither by his grand vicar, nor any known person, and consequently it was a complete nullity, according to the laws of the church. Fearing I would prosecute him as I threatened, he shrank from the responsibility of his own act and had not signed it. He was probably ignorant of the fact that he was himself excommunicated, ipso facto, for not having signed the document himself or by his known deputies. I learned afterwards that they had gotten a boy twelve years old to write and sign it. In this way it was impossible for me to bring that document before any court on account of its want of legal and necessary forms. That act was also void for being brought by three priests who were not mentally capable due to the fact that they were drunk. The people understood very well that the whole affair was a miserable farce designed to separate them from their pastor. By the good providence of God it had just the contrary effect. They had never shown me such sincere respect and devotedness as since that never-to-be-forgotten day.